welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for today's session on unlocking the new form builder. My name is Barrett Johannesson and I'll be the host today and answering any questions that you have um, and posing them to our presenters. Our amazing presenters are Jonathan Sue and Keith Garber. So just some announcements for you today. Um, on May 23rd and May 25th, we do have the Form Builder recertification. So if, you've some, if you are someone who went through the Form Builder certification in 2016, then it's probably time for you to go through the recertification. What's great about recertification is that it's half the time, half the cost, and not only do we go through this new Form Builder interface, but you're, you also learn additional page level JavaScript and more functions that you can do uh, with Form Building. If you are also looking to play around and become an expert form builder and you haven't gone through the certification session yet, the next one will be June 22nd, 21st, I mean June 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Our next announcement is that we are retiring the classic form builder in June. So for those of you who are joining today's session and you've never used the newer form builder interface, thank you for joining today and hopefully you get uh, some good understanding on how to start implementing your projects within this new form builder interface. Then when we go to our upcoming webinars on the 16th, we have Transformation Tuesday, and this topic will be parsing location element data uh, in new ways. So not you know going through the process of deciding if you're going to parse that location data within your form or if it makes more sense to do that formatting uh, within data flow automation. So that'll be a great half an hour session. The uh, next webinar that we have is on the 31st, and this is saving time with data flow automation. And then after that, on the 15th, we'll go into solving business problems with Xerion Web Services. Now, I know you are all very excited to go into today's topic and have John and Keith present, but before we do that, I do have two questions for you. So I'll go ahead and launch the first one. And let's quickly close that one and now do our next one, which is about the new form builder interface and your experience with it. So very, very interesting. And at this point, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you guys. All right. Thanks, Barrett. And good afternoon, everybody. So I'm really excited to bring this, uh, this webinar to you all today. Um, I know that this has been kind of a, a hot topic that a lot of people have been asking about especially with the, the impending retirement of the Classic Builder, we wanted to make sure we got some content out there uh, kind of showing everybody the new Form Builder. And then in order to enhance this a little bit, what we did is uh, we invited uh, Keith Garber onto this webinar. So he's going to be able to uh, answer some questions for us that we'll have for him. And Keith, did you want to go ahead and take a minute and introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Um, so I, I run the, the iForm Builder side. Um, as far as like development goes, so uh, we've been working on the form builder for the past past year, um, and looking forward to hear what you uh, what you guys think. So the way this webinar is going to be working today, uh, it's going to be a little bit different than our normal webinars. Uh, but what we're going to be doing is I chose and sampled four main kind of categories or different tasks that are going to be common tasks that you would do in either the classic or the new form builder. I'm going to be demoing these different tasks in the new builder, so you'll be able to see how these work. While I'm doing that, we're going to be able to highlight the interface changes, and then we're also going to be getting insight from Keith as to uh, why certain things were designed the way they were, and then also what types of enhancement that enhancements are there. And then at the end of this, we'll have some time for some question and answer if anybody wants to uh, ask some questions at that point. So to start things off, let's go ahead and talk about creating a form and then adding elements to it. And so uh, while I get into my environment. Barrett, did you want to ask Keith our first set of questions? So the first one here, Keith, is uh, what are the main reasons for building the new form builder? Um, so one main reason is, is security. Because um, right now the classic form builder is in Flash. And as we know that it Flash is very, uh, it's not very secure. Um, and also as many browsers are going to deprecate Flash, uh, we needed to be prepared and uh, release something new. Um, second is to help with the building the forms themselves. Um, I I build forms pretty much every day, um, constantly, and I know with the old form builder, um, 
that it's been very, it, it could be a struggle sometimes. So the, the main goal was to, you know, increase efficiency when, when building forms. Great. And did you have any design goals in, in mind before you started this process? Um, the main goal is to have less clicks. Um, so from, uh, you know, selecting an element to trying to just figure out where certain dynamic uh, values were or what they uh, were assigned to, um, we just wanted to make sure that you, you it was just le less clicks all around. Um, and try to present you as much information po as possible up front. Do you feel as though you achieved that goal? Um, I would say overall, yes. Um, of course, there's still room for improvement, um, but I think what we're what we're striving for is, you know, it, it's getting there. Um, I think overall, it's it's doing very well. And speaking of improvement, uh, would you say that the interface is still in development? Um, it's done, uh, but we're we're still yeah, still ready for improvement. Um, want would like to have some feedback with the community and uh, you know see where we can really enhance it. I think that sounds great. I mean, every, with like everything in software, it's always always emotion. <laughs> yep. All right, John, are you ready? I am. All right. So what I did was uh, after I logged into my environment here under the forms tab, I went to the form builder, the new one. And it brings me here. So there's a couple of things I want to highlight with this interface. Uh, the first thing is, and we'll return to it after I'm done, but you have this big create form button. That's where we're going to go after I talk about all of the other components here. Now, what we're able to do, which is really nice, is I'm able to search through my forms here if I'd like. Now, these two forms are pretty much the same thing, so you're not going to be able to see a difference. But uh, when you start getting a whole lot of forms inside of a profile, this can become very handy. Now, one of the things that I like the most about this new interface is this ability to show information in this tabled view. And not these are not the only fields that you can show. If I go to more, I'm able to check the reference IDs, and I use this one all the time, uh, especially with reference ID 5. If I want to have a set of forms having the same color, I'm able to take one of these forms. I can edit, grab the value go to the next one, paste it in, and then that's done. So I'm able to make changes to forms without having to go into them one at a time, and I found that to be a really big time saver. The other thing you're able to do is I could duplicate a form easily if I'd like here, uh, and then I can also delete a form if I would like here as well. Now, to give us some insight into what we're going to be doing today as I go through these steps, what we're going to be building is we're going to be building a form that's going to have two sets of longitude and latitude coordinates, and then we're going to be calculating the distance between them. Uh, I thought that this was a nice example that we could use because one, it'll fit within the time constraints, and also I know that uh, we've gotten this request from a couple of people, so I wanted to go ahead and show this solution to everybody. So let me go ahead and call this form, unlocking the new form builder. And all of this should look very familiar to everybody. The screen is about the same, and I click on create it's going to load us into this interface here. And so what we call this is the device view. Now, what you'll see is as I add elements to my form, uh, even though it's called a device view, that doesn't necessarily mean this is what it's going to look like on the device, but it just gives you a quick representation of the ordering of the elements. It's really meant to give you access to all of these properties on the right-hand side. Now, going back to what Keith had said earlier about how the goal was to reduce the number of clicks necessary when building forms, if you think about the old form builder when we would add a new element, after we add the element, we would then have to select the element type. What we have here on the left-hand side is a list of all the elements that we have possible. And by clicking on one of them, for example, the number, it adds it right away. And so now I've already reduced the amount of clicks I'm having to do right now. So let me go ahead and name this latitude number one. I'm going to quickly set this label here. And then again, what I can do here is I could duplicate this element because I want another number. We'll call this longitude number one. Okay. And then I'm going to do two more. And then while I name these actually, um, I did want to go through some of these icons, specifically this one. So this is my save icon. I'm actually going to do this right away right now. 
Uh, it's always a good idea to save your work frequently. I can edit the form properties here, and then I can go to my page level JavaScript here, which is one of the topics we'll talk about later on, so we will revisit this. But this icon's relatively new, even for the people who are using the new form builder, and you see what it says here is it says it shows dependencies of a form. And Keith, could you explain to us what a, a form dependency is while I go ahead and fill out the rest of these, uh, these data column names and labels? Sure. Um, so it's a big request that we've had over the, the past couple of years. Um, it's where you, if you have a subform or an option list and someone were to make a change on that subform or option list, um, you wanted to know what forms that would be, what forms would be affected. Um, so for instance, if you had an option list called yes, no, and a, um, and you wanted to add uh, another option called maybe, let's say, um, you, you, and you wanted to know how many options, how option, option pick elements would be affected by that. Uh, when you click on it, it'll actually show you a complete tree, tree structure of, um, from the parent form to the subform um, to the element name of what element is actually using the option list or yeah, using that op uh, specific option list. Um, so it just helps you protect yourself from um, running to an issue where like if you make a change on a subform and option list, you know what's gonna be affected. Um, we also make sure that you, know, you have the option of seeing it too when you're deleting a form because if you delete a subform and then you find out that it's being used somewhere else, then that means that subform will no longer work on that other form. Uh, so it's just a way to kind of backtrack, make sure you're covering all your bases before you make a change to subform or optionalist. Awesome, thanks Keith. And yeah, so just so everyone knows, uh, the reason this is relatively new is because uh, building out this enhancement was actually the winner of our feature frenzy earlier this year. And so we've just recently finished it. Uh, and it's, it's a really useful enhancement. It's really helpful in terms of, again, like Keith said, not making those critical errors uh, and realizing that you're changing something that's going to have an impact, you know, a couple levels up or a couple levels down. Now I've gone ahead and added in, so I have a long, latitude, longitude, I have two sets of these. Now I wanted to show a couple of things about the interface now that I have some content in here. The first thing is this left-hand column. Now once I've added all the elements I want onto my form, I'm able to actually hide this, which is kind of nice. It gives me a little bit more space to work with. Uh, it also helps me keep my focus because I only have two things on the screen now. Furthermore, on the right-hand side, you'll see under the element properties, we have these common properties, and these are going to be uh, properties that are going to exist for every element that you will have on your form. As we scroll down, you'll see that there are properties specific to that element itself. Now, if this was a different element type, these attributes would be different. And what we can do is instead of scrolling down all the way through these, I can actually minimize some of these, which is really helpful. It lets me jump back and forth between them pretty quickly. Now, as we walk down here, we'll have our smart controls, our dynamic value, condition value, label, and validation, reference IDs, and information. Now, say I were to add a text element to this form. So I want to do this real quickly. You would see that it would be inserted underneath whatever was selected. Now the reason I wanted to add a text element specifically was because I wanted to go ahead and show you that now you'll see that there's a smart table search property down here as well. And so these are going to dynamically show and collapse uh, depending on what you have selected. So only what is applicable will be shown. Now we don't need this element. I'm gonna go ahead and delete it. And what we're going to do next is I'm actually going to jump into my table view. So this is another view that we have in this new form builder, and this should look pretty familiar because it's very similar to that home screen of the, of the new form builder where we were able to choose which form we want. Now, this view is going to allow for the same types of things where we're able to add an element, duplicate, and then we can even cut and paste elements, which is really useful for moving sets of elements around in your form. Instead of having to drag it all the way up or all the way down, we can do this and it's a little bit more accurate. Now the reason I want to go to this view is because our next step in this form after we've made these is I actually want to give each one of these elements a default value. So what I'm going to do in order to do that is I'm going to choose to see the dynamic value column. Now at this point I actually don't need to know what data type it is. I also don't need to know what the label is. What I'm mostly interested in is the name 
because I'm going to use the data column name inside of each one of these dynamic values. So what we're going to do here is we're going to default each one of these values to the number zero. So I'm going to say latitude underscore one equals zero. Confirm this. Longitude one equals zero. Confirm this. And I'll do the same thing here. And then for my final one. Confirm this. You'll notice that they are yellow. That's going to mean that changes were made to that specific field. Once I go ahead and save this, those changes will be, uh, they will be verified. Okay. Now, at this point, Barrett, I did want to ask if there have been any questions that have popped up so far. Sure, there has. Um, the, there have been a couple, but one of them is what the character limit is for the dynamic and conditional value fields. And if uh, with that limit, could you mistakenly put in uh, too many characters? Um, that's a good question. Actually, Keith, do you know the answer to that question? I don't know what the exact limit is. Um, I think off the top of my head, it's 300. Um, and you sh cannot put in more characters um, in there. So uh, we, we do put a limit on there. Okay. Um, how many characters? Okay. So, and, and your suggestion would be if they reach that limit that they use the page level JavaScript instead? Correct, yes. Because page level JavaScript, you can have um, many, many more characters. Um, I think the limit is probably close to like 60,000 characters. <laughs> so, a lot of characters. Yeah. yeah, quite a room, quite a bit of room there. Yeah. All right, awesome. Great. And so, uh, now that we've done this, I did want to go ahead and show you how I normally like to set this up. So I use this view a lot to work with my smart controls because we're normally doing a lot of copy and pasting of the different columns. And so I tend to do it this way where after I've put all the elements in my form first in the device view, because I can just click on individual elements to add them, and I set up the labels and the data column names, then what I do is I come into this table view and then I can go ahead and edit my dynamic and condition values right here and it's all on one screen it's much easier to see and you're able to jump back and forth from element a lot faster so let's go ahead and I just want to do a real quick recap before we move on with our form so from here this is the form builder home screen and I just wanted to again reiterate some of the advancements here that you're going to see we're able to search through our forms we have if we have a large list we're able to collapse and expand the columns we see in this view as well. We're able to duplicate, edit, and delete forms very easily here. And then we have this nice big green button to create a new form as well. Now the last thing I have written up here is that you'll notice that there is a button for forms as well as a button for option lists. So these are now able to be managed separately. And so I'm kind of actually hinting towards what we're going to be talking about next. Now into this interface, uh, I want to again reiterate that you're able to switch views between your device view and your table view. Each one of these has its own pros and cons to it. I like to use the device view to add all the elements to my form, while I then use the table view to make the changes to my smart controls because I have the data column names available there. The other thing is in the upper right corner, you're going to see all of your form information. Like Keith talked about, you're able to, to see the dependencies of your subforms here. You can, you can save your form by clicking on this, and I always recommend saving your form frequently. You can view the form properties by clicking on this icon. And then finally, you can access the page level JavaScript here. Looking through the properties section, within each one of the subsections, you'll be able to collapse it by clicking on this little icon in the right-hand corner of it. You just click on an element in order to add them to your form, like I said earlier. And then the last thing I want to mention is that there's a small little footer at the bottom of this view that's going to have the form name. So let me go back in here and you can see it down here where it says form name is unlocking the new form builder as well as the label and the version. So this is a small little enhancement that may go unnoticed a lot of the times and quite honestly I forget it's there sometimes too. But for those of you who are used to working with the form tree structure and having to copy and paste the parent form name into your smart controls, this right here has been a huge time saver. Being able to copy and paste this in right away 
without having to go into the form properties and grab this has been really beneficial for me and my form building. So I always want to po uh, point this out to new people using the interface. And even people who are currently using it, you may not have noticed that this was here. Now talking about the table view, once we're in here, just like with our form home screen, we're able to collapse and expand our columns by clicking on these. Uh, if you click on the more, you have a large list of different columns you can show. I can go back to that so you can take a look. You can see pretty much any property that you have in your form is going to be shown here. But like I said before, the ones that you most commonly use are the dynamic and the condition value. One thing I will say is that when you're adding columns to the table, the order in which you click them is the order in which they show up. So if I click condition value, then dynamic value, which would make sense because that's the order they're in, condition value shows up first, dynamic after. Now, because I'm so used to building in the old for in the classic builder and then even in the device view here, I'm always used to the dynamic value be showing up above this or first. So whenever I do this, I'm always very careful to make sure I click dynamic value first and then condition value. It just helps keep things organized in my head. Now, the next thing I wanted to move on to to show everyone was the option list manager. So I talked about this before, how your option list manager is going to be separated out from actually building your option list in line in a form. And so while I get some stuff set up here, uh, Barrett, could you ask Keith the questions that we prepared for this section? I sure can. Um, one question that we kind of skipped over before, but I wanted to go back to is the, the key differences between the different home screens. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's about it. So, so Keith, can you, can you tell, tell us why they look so similar? Um, as far as the option list and the forms? Yep, the different home screens um, for those. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I mean, we just wanted to try to keep things consistent. Um, so when you're trying to switch between different, um, different things, uh, you're not confused on like how one side would work and how the other one uh, works as well. Um, so we just wanted, for consistency standpoint, um, just made it look the same. Because they look so similar, is there any um, thing specific I should try to focus in on if I don't remember if I'm in my option list builder or my form builder? If you look at the, uh, the top left, um, you'll see the option list is highlighted in blue. Um, that'll give you the indication that you're in the, uh, the option list manager. And now it's forms. Perfect. Thank you. And then going more into option list, why did you create it so that the option list was separated from the main builder? Um, so this was also a big thing that um, a lot of co uh, customers uh, brought up to us um, is where you, if you wanted to make a change to an option list, you always had to go into you know a form, click on an element, and then click on the option list to edit the option. Um, and we also that, so that was one thing is so, you know, less clicks making a change. Uh, the other one is to kind of separate them um, because option lists are kind of like forms, like they can be used in many different places. Um, so it's just another way to get you quicker to the option list and it lets you, let you make changes whenever you need to. Great. So you know, one thing I'll, I'll say, a lot of times when I'm building forms now, because you've ha we have it separate, I almost think of it as putting all the elements in the form design and putting all that in place and then going in and adding the option list and assigning them there, um, which I found it's a little bit different than what I'm used to, but it, it works really well. The next question is, do I still have that ability to create option lists in line when I'm working on the forms? Yes, you do. Um... So if you click on a pick list and click uh, assign option list or uh, option list manager, I believe it is, um, you'll still, you'll be brought up with a similar, similar um, interface. Um, so you can create, add, um, edit option list. Um, yeah, so this is it. So it's, it's pretty similar to the, the option list manager. Um, if you go to the main page, uh, but this just allows you to do it with inside the the forms, the form builder page. And are there some things that I can do in the option list builder that I can't do in this inline view? 
Uh, no, not really. Um, anything yes. you can do there is. <laughs> you, you can't upload option lists or copy yeah. option lists. <laughs> Tricked yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so I will, I'll stress that again for those of you who didn't realize I was tricking Keith there. Um, within the two builders, the inline versus the option list builder, the inline option list, you cannot copy an existing option list as well as you can't, you don't have the option to upload a CSV file or raw data for the option list to be built. So that's where uh, going into the option list builder gives you m uh, more options and allows for easier management of those larger lists. But with that, John, the floor is yours. Thanks. All right, so what we're gonna be doing here inside of this option list manager is we're going to be building a couple of different option lists. Now there's three main ways to build an option list uh, as it is now, and I wanted to walk through each one of them and talk about some of the enhancements within, e within each and then also the pros and cons of them. So to begin with, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new list. I'm going to call this list US States for the webinar. Let's create this. And it's going to bring me to like a tabled view where I'm able to set the sort order, the label, as well as the key value. Now from here, I could go ahead and start building my option list like normal. I could say something like Alabama. I can add Virginia. And then one of the things that's really cool about this is if I wanted to uh, keep my hands off the mouse or off your trackpad. As I type here, if I press tab, it's going to move me over to the next uh, column. And if I press enter, it's actually going to drop me down to a level below. And so this allows me to really type out my option list quickly. I don't have to worry about clicking around. Again, going back to that design goal, and this is going to let me build it out a little bit faster here. Now, I'm not going to sit here and type all 50 states for you all because one, that's gonna to take too much time, and then the other thing is there's a better way to do that. So from here, I'm gonna go and click on this little black icon with an up arrow. This is going to be where I have two options, a raw upload or a CSV upload. And we're gonna start with using the, using the raw upload. So what I'm able to do here is I'm able to take a list of values, I'm gonna copy this, and you, you'll notice each option is going to be on its own line and I can paste it in here, and I can click on Upload. I do not want to save the current changes. And what you'll see is it's going to automatically populate this option list here. So this is really the fastest way for you to make simple option lists. Now you'll notice that the label and the key value are always going to be the same. So that's the way the raw upload works. Because you're not pasting multiple columns, it's just the set of values, they're going to mirror one another. Now the other thing I'm able to do is I'm able to determine where I want to insert these options, whether it's at the bottom of my list at the top or below a specific entry. So if I take a look at the sort orders, if I wanted to insert my raw data between Idaho and Illinois, I could do that by setting this number to 11 when I do this raw upload. The final property you have that you can use to change the way this works is you're able to empty and replace current options. This is really useful, I find, when I'm testing out these option lists to make sure that everything works. So by keeping this checked off like this, what will happen is it'll effectively empty the option list. So the current options will be deleted, and then whatever I put into here is what will exist in the option list afterwards. Now, the last way, the third way, is the CSV upload. So as I click over here, this is going to allow you to upload a CSV file for your option list. Now, this is really useful because you're able to manage a large set of options and you're able to take advantage of spreadsheeting software in order to do things like sorts and organize the columns. Uh, and so I know that just from discussions with people, this is one of the most common things I, add, I have questions about. So not only did I wanna talk about the features here, I actually wanted to show you the process that I go through when it comes to setting up an option list using the CSV upload. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna download this sample template. So as I download this example, I'm able to then open it. And you'll notice here that there are one, two, three, four columns. So I have my label, my key value, 
my condition value, as well as my sort order. Now I'm going to delete this because this is just dummy information, but I'm going to leave the headings as they are. Now what I've done is I've already prepared a list here that we're going to be working with. And this list is of countries. Now I didn't include all the countries in the world, I just took a subset from a few continents. But what I have done right now is these countries are listed alphabetically. And you'll notice that there is the uh, respective continent that it belongs to on the right. And so this is my exact process whenever I go through these option lists. If I want to create a segmented option list, it doesn't make sense to have this sorted here because what's really happening is the values are going to be grouped by continent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first go up to sort and I'm going to say, hey, I want to sort this first by column B, my continent. Then I want to sort it by column A. So within that continent, then the countries inside of it will then be alphabetical afterwards. So having that two layered sort is very important. I'm going to click on OK, and you'll see these are now organized this way. I can actually get rid of this because this was a heading. Let's do this one more time. And we're good to go. So I have all of my different countries organized by continent all the way down through here. Now that I have this set up, this is exactly what I do. So I'm going to go ahead and select all of this data. I'm going to copy it. Moving back over here, and again, going back to the idea of taking advantage of spreadsheeting software, I'm actually going to insert a column. So from here, whoops. I want to, whoops, let me do this actually, let me paste this in here. This will work as well. So you notice that I have these continents here, and I always put these in first, because this is going to help me figure out my boundaries for my conditional values. So the next thing I want to do is write my condition values out. So I'm going to have to uh, know what my data column name is. I'm just going to call it continent is equal to Africa. Okay. And I can take this, copy it. I'm going to scroll down, find the boundary, do it for Asia. And I'm going to finish these up. And actually, Barrett, while I finish these up, do you want to give a real quick explanation of how this conditional value works for a segmented option list? Sure. I was actually just responding to some answers on the chat about this. So the way that the segmented option list works is you need to be able to, uh, there's usually at least two option lists that you're using. Uh, the first option list is going to be a higher level topic. And then the second option list will um, go into a little bit more detail and the appearance of that second option list and the options being shown will will change based off of what's selected in the first one. So for instance, there's a group that we're working in with right now that has two option lists. The first one is hospitals and the second one is wards. And based off of the hospital that the user selects, uh, they then want only the wards for that hospital to display. So what we're doing here is with the conditional values, and best practices to use ZC display key. Uh, we'll reference the element on uh, for the hospital option list from the form in the condition value here, and then in quotes we'll reference what the text is for that key value. Thanks, Barrett. No problem. All right, so I've gone and put all of my condition values in. I have them segmented here, so I have my condition for Africa, Asia, Europe, as well as North America. Now the next thing I need to do is I need to go ahead and set this column. So your sort order is going to be similar to a index in an array. So if you've worked with option lists before, you know that they start at the number zero. So the way I can do this very quickly is I can put the number zero in here. And then again, taking advantage of the spreadsheeting software, I'm going to put in a quick formula. I'm going to say this cell is equal to D2 plus 1. And so I can take that formula, copy it, and paste it all the way down here. So now I have my sort order set. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing with the key values. I'm going to say this is equal to A2. And so now I can just do a quick copy over for the key value for each of these countries. 
okay? And you'll see that my CSV file is now completed. So I've got my label set. I then went and did, after I did the sorting actually, I then copy and pasted this in, set my condition values, set the numbering for my sort order, and then I finally went and made the key value similar to the label. Now if I wanted to, again, you can use more Excel magic and you can set these key values to exactly how you want them to be. You can lowercase the values. You can do a lot of different things you want. For now, just for the purposes of time, we're gonna leave it as it is. I'm gonna go ahead and save this as webinar.csv. And now I'm gonna go ahead and go back and do my upload. So I'm gonna choose that file. And then again, I'd have this option to empty and replace current options if I'd like. So I'm gonna keep this enabled because I wanna get rid of what I had before. But I'm gonna click on upload. And you'll see I have all of this in here. If I click on condition value, you can see that my condition value is here as well. And this option list goes on down. Now you'll notice it cuts off here. That's because this is only gonna show 100 options at a time, noted right over here in the upper right. I can go through the pages though by clicking on these arrows. And so that's going to give you that smaller view and it's gonna let you loop through these options a little bit faster that way as well. You're not gonna get lost in a long list of, of 1,000 options. Okay, let me go ahead and save this. Oops, saved already, so we're good to go. Any questions at this point, Barrett? Uh, yes, there are some questions. Um, I'm going through them as fast as I can. But one thing that I thought was really helpful uh, to point out is that when you use the ZC display key or ZC display value for the condition value, uh, whatever text you have uh, within uh, that statement, within quotes, will need it is case sensitive. So you'll need to make sure you match um, those from the previous list. Now, another question I have for you, John, is there's some some individuals who, you know, they, they kind of struggle with the fact that they have to have both lists side by side to create these statements. Do you have any best practices or suggestions uh, that they go about doing this and eliminate error when they're doing this too? Uh, when you say both lists, do you mean needing the, like how I had both of the spreadsheets here? Yes, so the segmented list where you have option list one and option list two. Sure. Uh, what you're definitely going to want to do is you would go through the same process I went through here, uh, but you would want to start with the uppermost list. So in this case, I would want to make my option list for my continents first. After I've made that and I've added it to my form and I make sure I can get the value that I want, you would then go into building out the second option list because now I know that my condition values will have an actual match so I can check if the segmentation is correct. Now, in terms of how I set this up, um, having these two sheets is really useful because what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to use the spreadsheeting software to optimize your list before you even think about uploading it. So I had this list of countries. I put the respective continent next to it. And then at that point, I decided how I wanted to sort the information. So this column is always going to be the value that I'm expecting from the uppermost option list. So from the parent option list, if you want to think of it that way. So from the option list that I select the continent from, these are the expected values. So then what I did was I copied the entire thing and I pasted it in here, even though I knew I was gonna overwrite the key value eventually. And the main reason for that was I wanted to know where these breaks are, where the values change. So I knew where to place my condition values. All right after I set the condition values, then we did the sort order and then we went back into the key value. But it's really just following that methodical process. Don't try to, uh, to solve everything in one big step. Treat them as a series of smaller steps and just be methodical about it. Take it one step at a time. And working with the option list should be a lot easier that way. Uh, did you have any other tips for them, Barrett? So um, there was, I, I think you, you actually got all, all the tips, but 
And there are some questions from folks who are used to creating these statements with using the index value or what we now call sort order. Mm -hmm. Can you tell why we wouldn't want to use that? Absolutely. So let me go back here so we can talk about this. I'm going to hide my condition value. So in an option list, there are three key properties that you're going to have. You're going to have your sort order, which determines the ordering of the options, your label, which is the text that's shown on the device, and then finally your key value. Now the key value is what's actually stored in the database table when you choose that option. And for that reason, the key value must be unique. If you get errors when you do these raw uploads or the CSV uploads, at least in my experience, when I do these and I make mistakes, nine times out of 10 is because I have a repeat key value. Now the reason we wanna use ZC display key is because this value, not only is it unique, but it's also the least likely to change so if we were to use the index for all of our smart controls and all of our condition values, the problem is then that I'm no longer able to rearrange that option list because all of my smart controls are contingent on the ordering it was already in. In order to allow myself the option to manipulate the ordering, I want to not use those values. So you wouldn't use the index value. Now in terms of using the label, uh, the same scenario occurs where the label is also more likely to change. If your data collectors are having trouble figuring out what each option means, you may need to do an update on the label. Also, the label can be repeated, so there's nothing wrong with having two labels that are the same text. Granted, that's probably not the most clear option list, but uh, you'll run into a scenario where you may have multiple matches if you're doing a comparison, and that may not be the intended consequence you want. So for those reasons, we always recommend using the key value anytime you're writing your smart controls, whether it's for a segmented option list in a condition value here, or for a dynamic value inside of your form using an additional hidden text element. Any other questions, Barrett? Uh, not, not at the moment. All right. So at this point, uh, this option list that I made actually doesn't really pertain to our form. Granted, our form doesn't need an option list either, but I did want to walk you through the main benefits of the new option list manager. So again, when you're in this basic manual building mode, uh, you're able to type in your label. What will happen is the key value is going to mimic the label, so they will be the same. If you want, you're able to press the tab key, and that's going to move you over to the right one step. And if you want, when you press enter, that's going to move you down to a new row. So this way you're able to really fill out your option list without ever taking your hands off of the keyboard. When it comes to, cop to building out an option list with very basic data, you want to try to use the raw upload because for one, it's going to be the fastest way to do it. It's just a quick copy and paste. And then the other thing is um, from here, you're able to manipulate how you want those values inserted. You can do a bottom or top. You can empty the table if you would like as well. And just to recap those steps for that, we would click on the up arrow icon to go into this view. The next thing we would do is we would take our list of values, copy and paste it. And I want to make note that, like it says here, the key value will be the same as the label. And then finally, we click on upload, and that's it. The biggest thing to make sure you remember to do is to make sure that there are no entries with duplicates because that will cause an error since the key value is copied from the label. Even though you could have a duplicate label, you cannot have a duplicate key value. And so that would cause an error when you try to save. Finally, if you want to upload a CSV file, this is going to give you the most control over your option list and it's going to be the best way to manage large lists of options. The first thing you want to do is click over to CSV Upload. Then you'll want to download the example. Now, I did make a note here saying that we recommend using Google Sheets. I opened mine in Excel, which was fine. Uh, I found in the past that sometimes Excel does some weird things with the encoding for CSV files. Um, and so it's not that it does not work. It's just that I found that those errors happen less when I use Google Sheets to do the CSV modifications. It's also nice because it's a cloud-based tool, so you may have access to it while you don't have access to Excel. So I just wanted to make this quick note here for people. After you do it and you fill that out and you choose to upload it, you're going to find that file. You can decide if you want to empty the table or if you want to append what you're uploading to the end of the option list. And then finally you click on upload. 
And then again, just to reiterate one more time and to reinforce the fact that when we're doing it with a CSV upload, we're able to really leverage the power of our spreadsheeting software. We're able to sort the columns and we're able to more easily add condition values that way. Now, the last topic we have here is on page level JavaScript. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to uh, go back into my environment. And while I do that, Barrett, uh, could you ask Keith the questions we have for this section, please? Of course. So uh, the first question, Keith, was uh, why was the decision made to improve the page level JavaScript editor? Keith, you might be on mute. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so the main reason why we did that is because there are customers out there who can write, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 lines of code. Um, they really write um, pretty much their own program within our our platform. Um, and with that, it does come with, you know, some um, some it could some possibilities of errors because of syntax. Um, and in our classic builder, there were no there are no ways to see where the syntax errors could occur. Uh, whereas in the new JavaScript editor, um, it's all, it uses a JavaScript lint, so you'll, you're able to see, um, like where you can see here, uh, if there's any errors. So um, JavaScript likes to have semicolons at the end of each line. Um, if you declare a variable, it turns up orange. Um, so it's just very useful and visually more appealing um, and easier to read to see where, you know, where mistakes can happen. Because um, uh, as, even as a customer service person, uh, when we're trying to debug code, um, you know, we had to copy and paste uh, the page level JavaScript into another JavaScript uh, lint editor and, um, and try to debug it there. Whereas here, you're just able to do it here. Great. Now, Keith, what's something about page level JavaScript that the normal user may not realize they can do? Um, it's, I mean, it's a very, very powerful tool. Um, I'm not, <laughs> you can, uh, write your own functions. You can write your own, um, your variables. Um, yeah, so I just, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to cut in. So one of the things that I found very recently actually was you'll notice in my function. Uh, so what I'm, I've done here is I've defined a function, which is really just a, a name for a set of statements that are going to happen. And normally what you have to do is you have to give the function values for it to work. Without these values, for example, this is going to calculate the distance. If I don't have the latitude and longitude, this function cannot work. Now, if you've ever had the experience of writing a dynamic value in your form where you have to supply a whole bunch of data column names and you run out of space, then you go, okay, well, I guess I need to use a function. And then you start naming them different things. What I actually found recently was you can actually reference the variables in the form without having to pass them into the function. So if I wanted to do something like this, I could very easily do this variable. Um, we'll call this sample variable equals. And I can say something like parent form name dot data column name. And I can actually take a value from one of my elements assign it into a new variable, even though I did not pass this into my function. Now, if you're newer to JavaScript, a lot of what I said may have just gone over your head. Um, I want to apologize for that. But for those of us who are a little bit more accustomed to writing JavaScript code, uh, that's something that I found tremendously empowered me to write much more complex functions, not having to worry about character limits or all of my inputs but just knowing I had all of the different elements, values, and data column names at my disposal, even though I'm inside of a function, was a really great benefit that I found. Okay, uh, Barrett, anything else, or can I go ahead and continue forward? Um, there was a request that you share the form package after this, and I, I told them that uh, hopefully you're more than willing. Oh, 100%, yes, <laughs> this is going to be uh, up and available. So 
Uh, you'll be able to take this, you'll be able to, you know, unpack it and figure out everything you want from it after the, the webinar. And the other thing um, that I don't think you guys really touched upon yet is if you have an error within your, your JavaScript, what that looks like. Sure. So let's take a look at this line, line number three. And what we're going to do is the triple equal sign is what you use to check to see if two things are the same. A lot of times if you think unit is equal to undefined, though, you would think single equal sign. Now, if you make an error, what's going to happen is you're going to get this visual indicator that you have an error and that you'll be able to change it. So as soon as I make this modification, you'll see that the error goes away. Now, this is really useful when you're writing your code. So uh, Keith touched on it very briefly, but I really want to re reinforce this. I know that for me, when I was working with the Classic Builder, I really always had a separate window open where I did all of my JavaScript writing because it had these features. It had the color coloring, it had the, um, the syntax checking, and so I would kind of write my page level JavaScript outside of my form builder and then copy and paste it in when I was done. But since we've moved over to this new builder, I feel much more comfortable writing my code in here. I don't feel like there is a detriment to the time it takes me to develop because I'm able to see errors right away. I'm able to read the coloring and it helps me write my programs faster. And the last thing that I'll add here is uh, if you're in the table edit view, you can actually see underneath this interface. So you'll be able to see the data column name. So it's much easier to kind of remember what you have within your form and where you have to put variables and whatnot. Yep. All right, so um, I went ahead and copy and pasted this function in here. Um, I'm not going to walk through the entirety of it, but just know that it's going to take the latitude and longitude of each of the columns and then it's doing a whole bunch of math and then it's going to return the distance. So I'm gonna ask you all to trust me on this one. But after I save my page level JavaScript, I'm now able to use this function that I wrote. So I'm gonna copy the function name. And I'm gonna go ahead and add in another element down here called distance. And again, because I'm working with smart controls at this point, I'm jumping back over to my table view because I have all my data column names. I'm gonna show my dynamic value, get rid of my data type so I have more space. And in here, I'm gonna call my function. And I remember that the values it needed were the latitude and longitude for set one and set two. Now, I actually don't remember if it wanted lat one, long one, and then lat two, or if it wanted both latitudes at first. So let me check. So it wants the first set of coordinates and then the second set of coordinates. All right, so I get to go straight down the line. So I can say latitude one, comma, longitude one, comma, latitude two, comma, longitude two. All right, let me save this right here. And at this point, I'm gonna go ahead, refresh my form, and let's take a look to see what we get. And while I'm doing this, Barrett, have any questions come in? Um, nope, we're all caught up to, to the questions. All right. So let's go ahead and put in some dummy coordinates here. I'm going to say 33.4321. And then for the longitude, I'll say something like negative 77.3456. And then let's set another one. Whoops. I'm clicking around too fast here. We'll do uh, 45. And then the longitude, we'll say negative 60. Okay. And so as I put these in, it's going to give me my distance down below that's calculated automatically. Now, going back into the function, the way this works is it's actually giving it to me in kilometers. So that is the unit of measurement I wanted. If I want, because of the way I wrote this function, you're able to specify a unit. So you're able to do kilometers, meters, nautical miles, regular miles, and then feet. And then it will give you that calculation in that unit if you specify it. Otherwise, it's going to default to kilometers. But this is a really useful uh, a really useful function and a really useful form for taking those two sets of coordinates and then figuring out the distance. 
And that was definitely something, like I said, we've gotten a lot of feedback on, and I wanted to go ahead and present this, this solution to everybody. So to recap, talking about page level JavaScript, right, we're able to more easily identify coding errors as well as see the syntax coloring. Now, when we go ahead and upload the recording of this webinar and we upload the training materials, uh, you will have a form package that will also be included in Xerian Academy. And then if you get the PDF download of this, this will also be a link to that form package as well. So there's two ways to get to it. And then the very final thing I want to say about this is don't forget to save your page level JavaScript. This is a mistake I've made before, but make sure you save this here before you close out this window. All right. And that was everything that I had for today's webinar. Barrett, are there any final questions? There was some questions about um, your function, but they seem to have figured it out as you continued. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and I think if there are any um, any questions specifically about the function and the and the programming that's involved in that, uh, feel free to, to send me an email. My email address is right here, and I'll be happy to kind of talk through what that function does and what the different steps are in it. And the only other thing is, um, would you mind sharing with people uh, where they should leave any feedback that they have on the form builder interface? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what I would actually recommend doing is um, if you have information or if you have feedback about the interface itself, one of the things we can do is if we go to our customer oops, success center, okay. Um, you're able to contact us very easily here. That's one way to do it. Um, the other thing is when this webinar is put up on Xerian Academy, you'll be able to leave comments and feedback in the forum there as well. That's another avenue for you to do it. If you do it that way, I know Barrett and I will see it right away, and we can relay that information onto the team. Uh, but those are the two main ways I would suggest. Barrett, is there any can other you way? Show, yep, I was just going to say, can you go under the community and show them where the community forum is for this too? Absolutely. So from that home screen, I clicked on community. And if I scroll on down here, let's see here, which, which form are we looking for? Form Builder 2.0, Feature Enhancements, Bugs. There we go, right here. Okay. So this is a community forum where uh, you know, members who have an uh, account here are able to, to write and post and interact with one another. Uh, and this is also another really good place to post these comments about the new Form Builder. All right, any other questions, Barrett? That's it. All right, well, I wanna go ahead and thank uh, everybody for tuning in today. Keith, I wanna thank you especially for uh, joining this webinar with us today. And Barrett, thanks for hosting. In the next 48 hours, you're going to be getting an email. Within that email, uh, you'll have access to the recording of the session, the PDF, the form package. And then also, if you're not currently a Xerian Academy member yet, we'll be making a username for you and giving you login credentials for that as well. So until the next webinar, which is going to be on May 31st, where we'll be talking about data flow automation, I hope everyone has a good rest of the day, and we'll see you all then. Bye.